Renee, this process can be confusing. Ne me touche pas! Ne me touche pas! Parce que là, vous, vous m'énervez, là! Stop with your coffee! You're a stranger in a strange town. You play tough, but you're so candid. I'm young. I'm a movie star. I like when they look at you. What matters is staying sane. If you're a fan of French cinema, you most likely have at least heard of Olivier Assayas' 1996 French film, Irma Vep. Its unique structure and style of storytelling have granted it a cult following and high status in the minds of cinephiles. Irma Vep tackles many subjects including the filmmaking process, the actor's willingness to immerse themselves into a role, and the cinema industry as a whole. The one word I would use to describe it would be interconnected. With the release of the 2022 Irma Vep HBO TV show, I thought it would be fitting to discuss the relationship between both the initial film and the series and how they both relate to metacinema and its concepts. Here are the films that will be discussed in this video, so please be wary of spoilers for any of these and especially both versions of Irma Vep. Each rendition of Irma Vep is among the best examples of meta cinema I have ever seen, solely because of the depth to which the technique is achieved. Meta cinema is a specific process of filmmaking that is utilized for the audience to realize that they are watching a work of fiction. Meta aspects in a film commonly involve the connection to the line between reality and fiction, as well as links between other experiences. One of the earliest examples of metacinema is Dziga Veritov's 1929 experimental documentary film, Man with a Movie Camera. Here is the introduction to the film. In the 1920s, Veritov, along with his fellow Soviet filmmakers Yelizaveta Silova and Mikhail Kaufman, were part of a filmmaking movement dubbed the Kinoks, translated in English to Cinema Eyes, in which documentary cinema is preferred over any other type. Actors were heavily discouraged, while candid cameras were encouraged. Although there are plenty of political intricacies beneath the surface of the Kinok movement that I and many others may not agree with, there is no doubt that it has set itself apart from any other kind of cinematic movement, and it can be attributed as one of the many sparks of metacinema. As you can guess from the introduction, metacinema aims to distinguish itself from any other art form or works within its boundaries by explicitly changing the perspective of what or how will be witnessed, but only simply through the distinctive lens of movie making. However, Veritov only scratched the surface in terms of applying meta aspects to his films. Italian maestro Federico Fellini's Eight and a Half focuses on the artist's struggle to create while dealing with one's personal life. It is a film about filmmaking, in which the viewer sees the film made on screen as a film. The idea of mirror imagery constantly appears in Eight and a Half, much to the point where one is present literally in the ending. Blending themes of reality and fiction to this level of complexity showcases the power of its thematic significance. 
Abbas Kiarostami also intertwines reality into his films, but in a much more literal sense. His 1990 film Close Up is a documentary slash fiction hybrid that revolves around the trial of a man who impersonated Iranian filmmaker Mohsen Makhmabaf to swindle a family. The people involved in the case act as themselves, providing another avenue of connection between the subjects. Kiarostami's 1997 film Taste of Cherry's Ending incorporates the actual production into the thematic significance of the film. A slow burn filled with intrinsic meaning, the questions it presents linger for a long while. Matthew Lucas from The Front Row wrote about it, saying, The ending is ambiguous in the most lovely Kiarostami tradition, but its seg into the behind-the-scenes footage is as exhilarating as it is disorienting. It's as if the film is on the verge of revealing all the answers of life itself, and then pulls back at the last second, returning the mystery to the audience. In doing so, it attains a kind of haunting mysticism, profoundly shifting the audience's perception of reality. Michael Haneke's Funny Games directly presses its audience within the final twist, forcing the viewer to think about society's consumption of violence in filmmaking and the tropes it relies on. The remote control scene in which time is retracted plays with your mind, and the character Paul directly speaks to the audience. By directly predicting what the audience wishes, in this case rooting for the family's survival, a strange level of communication and messaging is established through his actions. David Lynch's Mulholland Drive uses real-life expectations of the glamorous Hollywood life and applies them to a character. When Naomi Watts' character Betty arrives in the City of Angels, her dreams are mirrored alongside the audience's initial view of how life as an upcoming movie star is projected to be. Her mind begins to become as foggy as the audience's, eventually past the point of no return. Charlie Kaufman's Synecdoche, New York builds upon the immersion of the artist into their work, eventually leading the artist's life to become their work, and vice versa. Philip Seymour Hoffman's character Caden Cattard builds a play within a play in which the viewer is seeing through the film. This obvious example combined with the numerous motifs that intertwine real life with philosophy creates an experience filled with visceral truth. Caden's world collides with ours and those around him, altering any sense of certainty present. These are all prime examples of films that are completely special and stand out from the crowd in terms of their cinematic prowess. All of them take one aspect of meta-cinema and use it to completely change the complexion of their work, elevating it to something undoubtedly unique. While some may think that its use in certain cases may be pretentious, Irma Vep uses meta-cinema to its advantage and is the best example of it being used solely to drive the force of the style and substance. Aspects of meta-cinema have evolved from all of the aforementioned to now reminiscing on related past works. In a world where entertainment is heavily abundant in franchises, films have recalled their past installments to conjure up nostalgia and integrate that into the story. Recent mainstream examples of this would be the 2022 films Matrix Resurrections and The Fifth Scream. Both draw direct connections to the first films in their respective franchises, blending their world into ours. Even Marvel's Spider-Man No Way Home directly takes Allah from Sam Raimi's original trilogy, catering to the fan-favorite memes. As these big studios continue to develop these never-ending meshes of worlds reliant on multiverses, I predict that this direct link between using meta-aspects of filmmaking to accommodate the desire for nostalgia will only increase. It is certainly refreshing to see HBO giving directors like Asayas an avenue to do what they desire, especially in today's increasingly harsh climate. Irma Vep is the benchmark for connecting one's new work to their old. One cannot discuss Irma Vep without at least mentioning the significance of Louis Filiade's French crime serial Les Vampires. Released in 10 separate episodes from 1915 to 1916, it is among the longest narrative features ever made and is responsible for major developments in the thriller and crime genres. Initially disliked by critics upon release, it has now garnered status as one of the most influential films of all time. If you're watching this video, you probably know the basic details of the serial, but here's a quick rundown of its relationship with Asayas' Irma Fep. Asayas tells us the story 
of a director's attempt to remake Les Vampires, and the actress's relationship with the character of Irma Vep. It focuses on the state of French cinema in the past and present, all while paying tribute to the original serial. I highly recommend watching the whole 10 episodes on the Criterion channel, since there is truly nothing like it. The link between the three works will come to life after seeing it. Every single metacinematic aspect that I mentioned previously will in some way relate to Irma Vep. I'll compare and contrast both versions and the events that unfold within them, beginning with Asaeus' 1996 feature version. One of the main characters in the film is Rene Vidal, who was placed in charge to direct the remake of Les Vampires. The production is a difficult one, and Rene's strong personality does not end up mixing well with the others on set, causing him to eventually leave. Since filmmaking and real life clash often, it makes sense that personal experiences from Maceus' life would also reflect themselves on screen. Rene Vidal is someone who is respected by all of his peers, and they view him as a skilled filmmaker who can produce what is needed on screen, but the tumultuous difficulties that he undergoes behind the screen cause problems. While Asaeus' challenges are most definitely metaphorically expressed through the problems of Rene, it is up to the audience to decipher just exactly what has been inspired by the work and not his personal life. This is also mirrored in how Rene is the only person in the show slash film who truly knows what is going on in every aspect, on screen and off it. In the TV show, Rene's struggles with his mental health and personal life are explored in more detail. The character is the same person, and he decides to take on the remake of Les Vampires in an attempt to rejuvenate his career. Unbeknownst to Assayas at the time of the release of the 1996 version of Irma Vep, the film would eventually become the biggest and most successful project of his career as a director. This foresight is something to commend, since it almost certainly wouldn't have been possible for the show to have been greenlit without the feature film being a main staple in global cinema. I also believe that this is reminiscent of Filiad's experience working with Les Vampires, confident in the fact that the art is groundbreaking, no matter how the mass generalizations paint it out to be. While Filiad, unfortunately, didn't live to see how much praise his work has garnered to this day, the confidence that drove Assayas further clearly established the groundwork for why the film was so loved in the first place. It's almost as if Assayas knew that Irma Vep would be the breakthrough in his career, leading everyone to finally recognize his talent. The endings of both the series and the film are incredibly different, and they showcase both sides of the spectrum. The film ends with a more uncertain look into the future, a one where Maggie and Renee both are not present. We see a part of the final edited film, filled with experimentation and abstraction. We are left in the dark as to how the production will continue, and we are not even sure if it will at all. The ending of the 1996 version was a herald of the change, since in the series, we directly witness Renee's reaction to the final cut of the film. Renee is finally content with his work, accepting of the fact that Mira and the crew have continued further, ultimately allowing him to be prepared for the rest of life's journey. Irma Vep's spirit emerges from the projector, thereby freeing Rene and Assayas from this tumultuous yet fulfilling journey. Through this method of filmmaking, Assayas was able to convey his real-life struggles and thoughts by being open with himself and the audience. Time will pass, and the spirit of Irma Vep will live on, passing her curses and blessings to the next. Iconic actress Maggie Chung plays a version of herself in the 1996 film while simultaneously preparing for her role as Irma Vep in her production. As a result of the meeting on the production, Chung and Assayas were married from 1998 to 2001, and their relationship obviously plays a significant part in the TV show. Since we all know that the TV show is a direct remake of the feature-length film, the main and most striking change relates to Maggie's character, who is no longer a part of the production, and as a result, obviously unable to portray herself. Instead, the great Alicia Vikander plays the lead as Mira. It is evident that Mira and Maggie are spiritually connected, but very different on the surface. Both the film and TV versions cover the fact that they feel somewhat uncomfortable in playing a character not meant for them, and how they have to navigate the situation around that. Maggie Chung is Asian and from Hong Kong, while Muzidora, the original actress for Irma Vep, 
is Caucasian and from France. She feels that this is somewhat of a burden and is eventually replaced by a French actress after the new director states that a Chinese person should not play a French icon. Alicia Vikander is Swedish in real life, but her character Mira Harburg is American. In the seventh episode, Mira finds the character Jade Lee at Renee's house and opens up about her culpability in playing Irma Vep. In this world, Irma Vep is a Chinese character, but Jade reaffirms to her that Irma Vep extends the boundaries of culture since the way that she portrays her is unique from anything else. This can serve as a direct metaphor for both actresses in real life having some uncertainty about how their portrayals would be received by the public. Irma Vep was quite a different project for Chung, being the first film she made outside of Hong Kong, while Vikander's show is a remake of the original. As we all know from the overwhelming popularity of bringing back past characters and franchises, they can either be hit or miss. Jade Lee, portrayed by Vivian Wu, is obviously an on-screen representation of Maggie Chung. In an interview with Entertainment Weekly, Vikander states, If people know Olivier's history and background, it's quite special to watch this series, because for a person in any way to open up and be so generous and transparent with their own anxieties or life choices and relationships or histories, it's fantastic. The truth is that the series actually did bring them to having contact for the first time in I don't know how many years. She gave her blessing for this to be made, and said that she'd read it and that it was all good. That in itself is a beautiful ending if you consider what the series is about. Jade is still Irma Vep just as much as Mira, and Maggie's blessing is represented on screen as the spirit of Irma Vep. Rene mentions that he believes the spirit is preventing him from completing the show, but the setbacks and blessings that it brought couldn't have been altered in any other way. In episode 4, Renee's conversation with his ex-wife Jade contains one of the most important sequences in the whole show. In an interview with Vanity Fair, Asaya states, I suppose I was reproducing the conversation I never had with her that I would have loved to have somehow. I mean, I became a character in my own film and my relationship with Maggie became part of the narrative. The web of events that led to the development of the show was completely unexpected. Chung initially was asked to reprise her role as herself for the dream sequence, but she refused. We can see all of the intricacies laid out between the couple, and it is clear that the past could not be avoided. This scene served as a form of closure for Asaeus, allowing him to move forward. The show wouldn't have the emotional impact without revisiting the painful memories, and in a way, it was just as vital to the story as real life. 26 years have passed in between the projects, both of which have been successful. It is incredibly difficult to pick up an idea and start again so far in the future and consistently maintain the same level of quality. The only other large-scale example that does this perfectly is David Lynch's original two-season Twin Peaks run, to Twin Peaks The Return. But even that had a different path compared to Irma Vep, since the foreshadowing in Twin Peaks was planned. Asaeus' life and cinematic work both have impacted Irma Vep, providing that the unexpected aspects of life truly cannot be explained. There are no easy answers in the world of art. In, in terms of feature films, did you, I mean, since you made your last film, have you just kind of not caught any ideas for features? Or did you just No, I've got, I had, you know, a couple of times uh, things that I thought I wanted to do and for one reason or another, <clears throat> it didn't happen. So uh, I think feature films are in trouble and the art houses are dead. Uh, so um, cable television being, a, you know, a place for a continuing story with, told with freedom is a beautiful thing. The film industry has radically changed since 1996 with the rise of the digital age and streaming services. The box office is heavily reliant on corporations and franchises, causing a rift between some older film-going audiences and newer ones. There has been debate as to whether theaters will still have the same impact 10 years from now, and if the future is completely digital. In an interview with Slash Film, Asaeus states, we are in a moment of very deep transformation of whatever we call cinema. There is very little space for auteur filmmaking or independent filmmaking in the way things seem to be evolving right now. 
The money is not there. The distribution formats are not there. So it's a moment and a lot of soul searching in terms of what cinema will be. The two main reasons why Irma Vep is a show rather than another feature film are simple. The financial aspect and the reflection of how the industry has evolved. Irma Vep simply couldn't be made into a feature film today because it wouldn't be able to get the funding. On the other hand, it makes sense that Irma Vep should be a series because of its spiritual connection to Le Vampires. As I said before, Fuyad's project was released in 10 episodes while Irma Vep was released in 8. Its viewership has been helped by this format and the project is lucky to be in a position where artistic integrity is not sacrificed for the sake of monetary gain. I believe that the state of the cinematic industry is regressing in some ways, but overall, the amount of artistic talent will not waver. As long as we can make room for all kinds of films and shows that prioritize quality over quantity, we'll be moving forward in the right direction. In the show, Mira talks to her agent Zelda about projects that will get her paid more, like superhero movies. Actors and directors should be able to pursue whatever they want to make, and as long as it is high quality, the financial aspects should follow. Irma Vep strives to achieve a balance between tradition and modernity, telling the audience that there is room for creativity for all, but we must strive toward it. Asseus weaves his ideas on the current climate by juxtaposing the state of cinema today to back then, as featured in Chung's on-set conversation in the film version. While Mira decides to skip her dream shapes photo shoot, the company that funded their production. True art will be made by those who care about it most, and change is inevitable. All artists must adapt, and they will. In an interview with the Los Angeles Times, Asaya states, I became part of my own film. So if I am doing a film using it as raw material my own film and my experience of making it, there are two different layers. One layer is the actual filmmaking and the character of Irma Vep, and the other layer is obviously how the film changed my life, how I got married and then separated with Maggie. That was not part of the plan. That was not something I had in mind when I started thinking, but it's something I realized when I started writing. I instantly realized that I'm a part of this, willingly or unwillingly. Even if I've always used a lot of biographical elements in my films, this is of a different nature. This is something I had never really confronted. There was a lot left unsaid. Asaius' response to refers to the question which was very popular with the press. Why make this? The development of this project has been arduous and ever-changing, both for the creators and the audience. Most fans of the original film, like myself, were optimistic about the production of the show, while those who aren't aware of the film version probably were more skeptical. It's a risky attempt, but one that paid off. Remaking your own project often falls on either side of the spectrum, wildly successful or an unfortunate failure. Asaius didn't even rewatch his film before shooting the show because he didn't want to ruin the experience. In such a personal project, it was clear that Asaius' passion for filmmaking shone through brilliantly, and Irma Vep is just as much for him as it is for the audience. The film and the show both revolve around real production aspects that involve detailed discussions between crew members and producers. While not quite at the level of confusion and complexity of the play within a play technique featured in Kaufman's Synecdoche, New York, the layers serve a definite purpose. Kaufman uses motifs to explain philosophical meditations on life on a grand scale. Asaius uses the technique to give meaning to his experiences and past work. Many parts of Irma Vep feature this level of depth from Chung's portrayal of a version of herself to the merging of the character and person, which builds a world in which the viewer can become fully engrossed. In Eliza Ma's essay for Criterion, Irma Vep, Film and Flux, she writes, Asaius has a remarkable way of bringing abstract ideas and philosophical challenges down to a tangible, tactile level. His porous method of filmmaking catches moments of levity, liminality, and humanity to create something closer to the scale of intimate individual experience than most directors are able to. A less experienced director may use the film within a film technique as a gimmick to mask the less effective elements of the work, but Asaius does not succumb to this. The ending sequence in the film features a part of Renee's remake, resulting in a dynamic, extravagant, and commanding ending. The crew watches the scene for the first time alongside the audience, and the series links this feeling of uncertainty I previously mentioned, connecting it to a larger context. The evolution of cinema, 
and how its connection with the past and future will always remain. Irma Vep is truly a special work of art, and it is my favorite narrative TV show of this year so far. As a fan of the film, with high expectations, I was not disappointed in any way. Both versions are now streaming on HBO Max, so I highly recommend watching them as soon as possible if you haven't already. I plan to release more of these longer formatted videos that connect several works to one another, so if that's something you're interested in, be sure to subscribe with the notification bell on, leave a like, and comment your thoughts on the video and the Irma Veps down below. If you enjoy my work and would like to support me even further, please consider checking out my Patreon in the description down below. Thank you for watching once again, and I hope this has helped you appreciate cinema more than you already have today.